Hi, I'm John Darkarbs. Last week I had a couple of tracks critiqued in the Marotopia community, and after mine we heard one track from Deadform, but there wasn't enough time in the show for his second. He and I connected over DMs afterwards though, and he sent me what would have been the second track, and I thought it sounded really good. And I felt I could improve on the mix and master to help elevate the production. That track is Retro Kit Reviver, and these videos document this process. We are starting here near the end of the mix session. Two days prior to this, I had a session where I organized and exported stems from his Ableton project, brought those stems into Logic, and applied a certain template of mix mastering strategies. Having had a day away from it, when I loaded up the project today and compared to the references, my ears were fresh and I had enough objectivity to immediately get a good feel for what was missing. So what we're seeing now is just a final process where I'm engaging a few other strategies that I think work quite well for um, really matching um, your final result. And one of the things I'm doing here is I've put a Pro MB on the output channel, which um, I just, I, I'm not processing the, the audio, I'm just using it as a bandpass filter. It's just a convenient one. And, um, and so, you know, you'll see me flipping back and forth between the mix bus and the uh, reference. And what I've sort of established here, having checked against Robert Babbage's track is that, um, I'm really missing like a whole lot of presence in this kind of very low sub range, um, sort of above 30, below 60 or 70. Um, and the, uh, the spectral analyzer um, that I have on the output channel is, is telling me that, helping me, you know, helping me realize that. So um, what's happening here is that I'm searching for strategies to how can I inject more of that band back into the mix um, without having to go back to the original project and try and re-export stems because I think one of the problems um, with the content that came to me was for example the kick didn't have quite enough um, decay on it it was already quite um, quite strongly gated um, so right now what you're seeing me do is using um, uh, Saturn to try and uh, coax more low lows um, out of the kick. And one strategy that I've been using recently, I, I love Saturn um, for this, is you know using the feedback function uh, and tuning the frequency so that it's sort of in key. So sometimes you have to turn your monitors way up to really hear what's happening here. So a lot of the time I'm doing that, you can't hear that obviously, um, but I'm searching for um, the the tonic the low the low fundamental note that is in key with the track uh, so I'm tuning the um, the feedback frequency and I'm trying to just trying to add a little bit I'm basically trying to artificially create a longer decay on the kick um, and this sort of works it, it, I think it, you know it adds it, it adds a little something there, but um, I move on to the 303 in a bit and coax more out of that too. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to squash it. Use I find using the squashy end of the dynamics control on Saturn 2 will pick out the feedback more. The feedback will will feed back more readily, uh, and I'm experimenting here with different. Um, you know, uh, saturation algorithms, but I, I don't want to color it um, things too much. So um, that's what's happening here. Uh, and then over on Decapitator, which is next in the chain, this is not multiband, this is just the whole kick. Uh, again, just kind of making sure that I am squeezing it sufficiently without really degrading the audio or changing the uh, tonal characteristic. Okay, so Pro MB on the kick. I think it, here I am again trying to do what I can to squeeze a little bit more decay out of this kick. Um, and also I'm, I'm just, you know, soloing this band to 
try and find where that biting point is on the um, on the crossover uh, so that you know I can fill in the the, the blanks in that um, 30 to 60 or 70 Hertz zone so this is a, a you know fast attack slow release style of compression which means um, you know higher average loudness lower peak loudness um, so it's not about making a spiky transient it's about having a, a, a signal that is very lacking in dynamics because I just want thickness and presence um, but the dynamics of the kick will will come through in the you know in that in that zone well basically above the cutoff 90 Hertz that's where the kick really punches you so you know these are strategies um, for slightly less than ideal input sound sources if I was producing the track I would try and design the kick drum with a little more decay in it because of course you can always take things away with a noise gate um, whereas if you don't have enough decay in the kick to begin with uh, then you, you, might, you might be a little stuck anyway so this is a pretty significant boost here that's a whole 6 dB of boost I mean it's quite a lot um, yeah, I think I'm really like trying, I'm, I'm, I'm really slamming it quite hard, bearing in mind that this is going into a limiter, right, on the master mix bus, so over here I'm checking in on the limiter, I'm like, okay, well this seems like a ridiculous amount of boost, this must be, the limiter must be behaving differently while I have this engaged, so I'm checking that right now, I just turn MB back on, and I'm looking at the amount of gain reduction on the Pro L2, and I can see that, um, Yes, indeed, there's an extra, but only one dB of gain reduction as compared to when, um, uh, you, you know, when it was off. So actually, it's not that much, and it, that tells me that there really is not very much energy down there at all. You know, with a massive boost like that, I'm, I'm only, um, you know, I'm only causing the limiter to be a, a, a little bit more um, reactive. So I have to look elsewhere. I, I still need to coax more of that low low um, so here again I've soloed that band on the output group the final final output and we're listening to Robert Babbage and we're listening to us we're swapping back and forth and it's this kind of like there's just it's more constant the, the energy is just there more constantly when Robert Babbage is in and, and when we're just listening to that low band by isolating the, the low band you um, you remove the distraction of hearing everything else in the mix and it just helps you see okay so here I am using an effect that I never thought I would ever use in my whole life this is the, literally the first time I've ever used this effect in logic as you can see it's a legacy effect that they've just left in but obviously hasn't been updated because it's still using the logic 9 UI and I shit you not this is the very first time I've ever used this and actually it was exactly what was required and it what it is doing it is artificially creating um, sub bass below the uh, fundamental frequency that it finds at the input and that input is the low 303 which is really a very very low mid-range sound and there's actually nothing going on in the low low so I artificially created some sub um, using the sub bass plugin first time I've ever used that and it really worked it actually did properly fill in that low band so I'm about to solo it again yes I am and um, I'm just noticing that it's fuller okay so I'm just setting up a loop region so that we don't go into the breakdown I just want to have it full full tilt the whole time um, here I am just kind of experimenting with the cutoff point because there somewhere along this you know, some, somewhere along this band that I'm sweeping through, there will be this ideal spot um, where you get the right balance of dynamics. Um, and, you know, at certain points, it will kind of sound harmonically different also. Uh, oh, yeah, and I noticed that actually while soloing that low, low band, the hydrosynth wave, which is, you know, one of the parts, but it's a melodic part, in the track um, that was actually coming through in that low low band I could just hear it so I felt well you know it doesn't need to be in there really hardly at all so that's what that was
Okay, so going back to the reference again, checking against me, and I'm feeling that we're getting closer. So now I've decided, okay, I want to see what's going on with the mid-range. So we're going to do exactly the same process, but I'm checking the mid-range instead. So, you know, maximum threshold. So there's no gain, I don't want any gain reduction. I literally just want to use this as a bandpass filter to so listen. So now I'm checking out the difference between Robert Babich and my mix in terms of the mid-range. And again, it's a case of fullness, really. It's just presence. How much is hmm, really just average loudness RMS? It feels to me that there is just, it, it, it's not as persistent. Um, so we can squeeze more persistence out of the mid-range with dynamics. Pro MV is obviously awesome for this, so I'm going to be loading a Pro MV on the um, on the whole mix, because I actually didn't have one um, on the whole mix, I just was using it for monitoring. So now I'm actually applying Pro MV to the mix bus. Again, listening, comparing, what's missing? Well, what I end up doing here is um, often referred to as uh, upward compression or expansion, um, where instead of, um, instead of the processor turning down the input signal when it exceeds the threshold, it actually pushes it up, it gives it a boost. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. About to do. Comparing again, initially I think I felt okay, I'll go for squashy loudness. So, um, you know, where the compressor is working all the time and you're just turning up the overall result. But no, instead, I choose to do a more punchy style of dynamic processing where I'm basically boosting the signal when it exceeds a certain level. And I found that it just created an extra rhythmic um, feeling. It just kind of had a nice, created a nice rhythmic um, pattern to that band. And compensating the overall output of that band. And I end up going very wide with it. And actually, I end up Comparing, just filling that gap, filling those gaps, tuning the release so that it just feels right. I mean, a lot of this is is by feeling, I suppose. I'm kind of looking for the for the um, for the amplification or the boost to have faded away um, within a certain time so that the next transient that comes through can push it back up again, um, or nearly nearly completing its, its, um, its decay phase, Some, something fairly close. So that's what I have there. So closer and closer. I think at this point, I'm probably thinking about exactly the same strategy once more, but on the highs. Once more, putting a band on the stereo output so that I can compare. Same, same deal, just not compressed enough. <laughs> uh, not constant and present enough. And I think in this case, I go for a RMS type of constant gain reduction plus overall output boost style of compression rather than something um, punchy and dynamic because um, you don't want those very high frequencies to be spiking at you. You want them to be smooth, full and smooth, I think. So again, that's what's happening here. I'm comparing the Robert Babbage track to this. I'm just making an assessment about what should happen. 
So I'll put it into compressor mode, fast attack, slow release, so that it's always working and then boosting the output. and it just seems closer. It's closer and closer. So here we hear the whole mix again. And checking in on the limiter, seeing, well, okay, with all of that extra processing, is my limiter all of a sudden working much harder? And the answer is not really. It's fine, actually. I was quite sort of glad to see that. So looking at the analyzer, I see that I have filled in that low band just a little bit more. Not as much as what was going on in Robert Babbage's track. Um, but closer. In the second video, we go back to the actual beginning of the process where I received a couple of um, Ableton projects from Mike Deadform um, and used those to export um, audio stems of the project. So if you've never done stems before and maybe don't understand why they're useful, or how to do them or what it really means, then check out that video because um, it's a pretty good primer. But if you totally do know what stems are, then skip it and go to the third video in this series where um, we start from the actual taking the stems into logic and beginning to address the finer points of what we need to do to elevate all the different sounds and, and into a tighter, bigger, fuller mix. So uh, enjoy.